Chapter 2 Avoiding the Management Trap Reinforce Self-Sufficiency Rather Than Dependency Network marketing is based on a team-building philosophy rather than a supervisory one. Perhaps the single most frequent cause of failure in network marketing is the mistaken belief that we must manage our downline distributors. Typically, after new associates spend their first month or two recruiting 10 or 15 friends, they end up devoting the rest of their time attempting to make those few people successful. That's what we call the management trap. Let us quickly point out that there is a significant difference between managing and supporting a downline organization. Playing caretaker to their organization causes new networkers to spend a disproportionate amount of time on a particular leg or legs of their downline, to the exclusion of everyone and everything else. It creates a false codependency, doing for others instead of teaching and encouraging them to do for themselves. The management trap creates two serious problems for a business builder. First, it produces weak and lethargic distributors because someone else is doing their work for them. Second, while managing others, that networker loses valuable time that could be more wisely invested in prospecting and recruiting new frontline distributors. And remember, new blood is the lifeblood of any organization. Continually sponsoring new associates adds vitality to an entire business. If you stop recruiting before you are earning enough to live comfortably, then you lose valuable ground. And worse, since our business is a business of leading by example, your leaders will emulate you so that everyone ends up managing and no one is prospecting or recruiting. Supporting an organization, on the other hand, is part of the team approach inherent in network marketing. It involves responding to legitimate requests on the part of any and all of your associates to help close a serious prospect or give them encouragement when they are feeling down. In this chapter, we intend to describe the difference between creating dependency in your organization and reinforcing self-sufficiency. It is critical that novice network marketers recognize the difference between productive activity and ineffectual time-wasting practices. Sponsoring Family Members and Building for Them Mark discovered the pitfalls of supervising his family's line the hard way when he recruited his own father. As he tells the story, It really hurt when my father said, Son, you're embarrassing me and ridiculing the family name in Missouri by selling snake oil in one of those damn pyramid scams. It hurt because I had always loved and respected my father. He never made much money while we were growing up, but he did start his own advertising and public relations firm. He also wrote two novels, one of which, Man Trap, became a bestseller in 1948. Dad was a proud man who always told me that integrity is more important than wealth, and to never do business with a man whom you can't trust with a handshake. By the time I was a 16-year-old sophomore at Glendale High School in Springfield, Missouri, Dad left the field of writing novels and magazine articles to launch an advertising agency. I was so proud when he trusted me to go out and solicit clients. He said that if I could get a client to use our agency, he would let me have a shot at writing the copy. I was so enthusiastic that I went charging out and actually obtained a client the first week. The guy's name was Jerry Vaughn, and he was preparing to launch a new pet store in a little shopping center near our home. Somehow, probably on sheer guts and enthusiasm, I convinced him to give me a chance. I went back to Dad's office, scarcely able to contain myself, and broke the good news to him. I don't remember Dad ever really getting too excited about any of my accomplishments, but I could tell he was pleased. For the next several years, I wrote copy and created ads for clients whom I picked up along the way. Some of my ad campaigns were quite well received, while others were not so successful. But through all the years, Dad supported and encouraged me that is, until six months before my graduation. I didn't realize it at the time, but Dad really wanted out of the stress. Apparently, in my ignorance, I failed to see his hope that following college graduation, an event, by the way, that never occurred, I would be interested in becoming his partner, perhaps even one day taking over the entire ad agency. I had other plans. 
In hindsight, I suppose my pronouncement at our 1971 family reunion that I intended to enter a seminary and ultimately become a minister really caused him pain. I later found out from Mom that he saw it as a real slap in the face after all the years of working together. But that's life. I was to become a minister several years later, after a series of sales jobs. Just about the time my father was accepting my ministry and actually beginning to tell our friends with pride how his son's church was growing, I told him something that would result in our not speaking for nearly a year. I told him on the telephone that I had become a distributor in a new company in the field of network marketing. I'll never forget the uncomfortable two-minute silence that occurred when I asked, Dad, can I send you some shampoo and conditioner? I know you're going to love them. Silence. After a couple of minutes, minutes that felt like an hour each, I broke the uncomfortable silence by asking him to which address he wished me to mail the shampoo. That's when it hit the proverbial fan. What the hell, son? You go to seminary, become a minister, now you're quitting that too? You're a quitter. And how could you disgrace the family name by getting into a pyramid? He abruptly hung up. Naturally, I was miserable with rejection. That all changed, however, when I received an apology call a year later. Dad had heard from my sister that I'd built a sizable downline and was earning more each month than he was earning in a year. He called and congratulated me for my success. Then he came clean about his health. The stress was causing him heart problems, and in addition to apologizing for judging me so harshly, he also intimated that maybe I could help him get out of the rat race of public relations. That was all I needed. The next week I was on a plane to Missouri to sign up my father and get him out of traditional business. I was very excited about the prospect of helping my dad change his life. And the reason I explained our backgrounds here in such detail is to help you understand my reason for wanting so desperately to help him. You see, this was my first experience with the formidable management trap, that is, the supervision of one's downline. Before pointing out my mistakes, I want the reader to fully understand the situation, and I want to do everything possible to help you avoid this devastating trap, because it is very counterproductive and most often leads to failure. Our parents, siblings, and closest friends are usually the ones who lure us into the management trap. I spent four months in Springfield, Missouri, helping my father build his organization. The problem was that all Dad's people looked to me for leadership, because I was doing everything for him. Not only that, but the rest of my entire group was suffering, because I wasn't available to respond to their questions. Those four months that I dedicated to managing my father and his entire group were the most counterproductive of my entire career in networking. The only real value to come out of it was that I learned about the devastation of playing nursemaid to one leg of my downline and began immediately to incorporate it into our training sessions in order to keep others from making the same mistake. When I left Springfield, everything I had built began to crumble immediately. The new people on my father's front line regarded me as their mentor, and when I no longer had time to support them as effectively as I had while living in Springfield, Several became despondent and quit in the first month. Dad was frustrated because he had no idea how to lead his people, and they didn't look to him for leadership anyway. I created a cripple of my own father because, for all practical purposes, I became the director of an adult daycare center. But here's the real tragedy. Dad had the ability to succeed dramatically in network marketing. He had great communication skills, loved working with people, and had the overall competence in business that would have allowed him to build and run a quite successful organization worldwide. But I ruined it for him. You see, I loved him so much and was so committed to his success that I inadvertently created a weak person out of a strong one. My father's gone now. He passed away last year. And sometimes while sitting in the solitude of my study thinking of Dad, I secretly wish an angel would appear and wave a magic wand, leaving behind a tiny golden plaque above his ashes which reads, Here lies a great man, Dwayne Yarnell, who could have been greater had his son not loved him too much.
But because I didn't know then what I know now, I feel no real guilt. Dad and I had a great friendship to the very end. Next, I headed straight to Orlando, where my sister Melissa was a very successful executive analyst for the Tupperware Company. With my sister, I had a legitimate reason to enter the management trap, or so I then mistakenly thought, because I felt that she had a personal conflict of interest. Because Tupperware is a direct sales company, Melissa felt that for her to build a network in another company would be entirely inappropriate. I admired her decision and decided, once again, to manage my sister's entire downline. I recruited her frontline leaders, trained them, and supported them because Melissa just couldn't violate the trust Tupperware had placed in her. Once again, I fell unwittingly victim to this administrative role. Meanwhile, all my other organizations across the country were feeling the frustration of seldom reaching me because I was so vitally focused on managing my own family's groups. To make a long story short, when I went back to my own home in Aspen, Colorado, I had successfully wasted over eight months building my executive downlines for both my father and sister. Within a year, both relatives had quit, and virtually everyone in both of their organizations had either quit or become wholesale buyers of the product. I had wasted so much time, and worse, by loving them too much, had unwittingly stripped them of their leadership roles. Fortunately, Dad had managed to recruit a couple of my old high school and college buddies, Gary Turner and Jim Grundy. Over the years, they did quite well, but in the end, both opted to pursue other avenues, and today we earn not one penny from the efforts of extensively working with relatives. Taking on the position of caretaker to my group served to lower my income, spoil both my father's and sister's chances to succeed, and throw me off track for nearly a year. The truth is, I should have spent only one week in each city training Dad and Melissa. Then they might have both been prepared to build their groups. If you find yourself alone in network marketing, with none of your family members supporting you, there are better ways to transform them than trying to coerce them into the business, and then doing it all for them. If we want to change others, we begin by changing ourselves, and alterations in their behavior will naturally follow. The truth is that we are empowered far less by heredity, luck, and circumstances than by our vision of what we believe is truly possible for ourselves. Jimmy Cossert of Renton, Washington, is one of the legendary big-money earners in the networking industry. But it took an early morning self-evaluation to break an inherited cycle that had predominated in his family for over a century. He explained it to us in this way. It was near the end of my first year in MLM that I chose, early one morning at 5 o'clock a.m., to break the cycle of poverty that had been in my family for generations. Everyone I recruited had quit. Everyone. Everyone I loved had told me no. I had no money coming in, no chance to return to a downward spiraling real estate market with any hope of financial recovery, no experience in other fields, no college education, and no will to persevere. My great-grandfather had been poor and uneducated, as had my grandfather, my father, and now me. Poverty, I thought, just ran in the family. My wife and children slept silently, and as I sat contemplating these people I so loved, and our uncertain future, a blinding flash hit me. Everyone in my past, perhaps at one time or another, had probably lamented the rotten hand they'd been dealt. But unlike them, I had one ace in the hole. Unlike my ancestors, I was now privileged to be in a great company, where people were actually earning unlimited income. None of my forefathers had ever been given that option. I, Jimmy Cossert, had been chosen to lead the charge out of generations of servitude and mediocrity for an entire ancestry who, before me, were never so privileged as to be able to restore dignity to our family tree. As I tiptoed to the bedsides of my one- and three-year-olds, I silently affirmed, I will do for you what my great-grandfather would have done given the same opportunity. I will finish this race, and I will win. From that moment on, I set out to break the cycle of poverty. 
I know my predecessors might have done so themselves, had they been blessed with an unlimited income opportunity. My wealth now stands as a testament to a great-grandfather who persevered in everything he did in a generation which offered no possibility for wealth and time freedom for poor, uneducated people. None of my kids will ever have to sit in the dark at 5 o'clock a.m. and feel depressed because they're impoverished. Thanks to network marketing, the cycle is now broken. The Messiah Complex With both of us coming from theological backgrounds, we know what it's like to be victims of the Messiah Complex, which is very similar to the management trap, but with more emphasis on saving people. Given our backgrounds, at one time or another, we wanted to save the entire world and every single person we sponsored. Each time we found a good person, especially one who appeared to need saving, we would end up dedicating much of our time managing that individual and his or her entire organization. But it doesn't work, as Renee and I both learned over and over. Here's the irony. Those frontline recruits who demand the least attention are usually the ones who become the most successful. For example, let's consider Dennis and David Clifton, brothers from Texas. At the time, Dennis was a student in the doctoral program at the University of Texas, and David was a detective with the Houston Police Department. After only about a month in the business, Mark recruited Dennis and taught him everything he knew, and Dennis then taught David what Mark had shared with him. Mark initially thought he had offended them somehow when their phone calls ceased to come daily, but he discovered that they didn't need him like they did in the very beginning. They had their serious prospects call him to confirm the authenticity of this business and to be closed, but otherwise they understood the simplicity of recruiting and training others, and they just did it. If there's one primary lesson we learned during our first few years in networking, it's that those recruits who need us the most usually succeed the least, and those who prosper self-sufficiently deserve all the credit. Mark recalls, I remember it feeling like a real slap to my ego the first time Dennis Clifton went an entire month without calling for help. Yet when I awakened from my need-to-be-needed stupor, I was astounded to discover that the Clifton boys had passed me by. Only in MLM is it rewarding to have our downline members reach the very top level of our compensation plan before us. Kathy Dennison and Terry Hill needed no Messiah either. In spite of the fact that neither had ever participated in MLM before, even as frontline distributors, they simply didn't need Mark to save them. Except for a few telephone calls their first month or two, and some help closing prospects in their first years, they became totally self-sufficient immediately. The new people who whined and moaned and complained were all out of the business in a few months. Those who have become millionaires did it primarily on their own. Mark gave them the support and the duplicable system Richard Call taught him, and they proceeded to successfully accomplish great things. They are all winners. The last thing a winner needs is a manager or a savior. Remember, if new recruits finish their training and go to work without calling you every day and asking you to do everything for them, don't be offended. Be joyous. In this business, everyone has the ability to do great things, but those who lean on their uplines for everything are usually the ones who fail the most rapidly. What makes our industry so much grander than traditional employment opportunities is the fact that we are compensated for our productivity. We aren't like some traditional corporations, such as TWA, who, at the time of this printing, haven't given their hardest-working employees a raise in ten years, while their CEO allegedly continues to earn $3,000 a day. If new associates want to earn more than a particular leader above them, they just need to be more productive, i.e., find more frontline distributors and customers who will use and share the products. That's what we love most about our business. While we can never actually lose our downlines, unless we stop ordering products, our downline leaders can certainly pass us in earnings. And some of ours have, especially since 1992, when we chose to dedicate ourselves to enhancing this industry's image through positive articles and media reports, lectures to universities, clubs and organizations, and books such as this.
We haven't actively pursued frontline recruiting nearly to the extent we did our first few years because we've elected to use the freedom earned for other causes. Additionally, we are upline leaders to some very sizable international organizations, all of which expect us to be present in their cities at least once a year. We travel extensively in some 20 countries. From Tokyo to Dallas and Sydney to London, we love to spend time with our friends and associates throughout the world. And even now, while we conscientiously avoid sinking into the director's seat, we do nevertheless feel a definite desire to spend quality time in each leader's city. Due to our travel agenda, several key players in our downline, some who have been in the business half as long as us, have become more prosperous. Why? Because they kept on frontline recruiting. That's the primary way to increase income. Yet we still have a significant number of people who deserve to earn more but don't because they are bogged down in the management trap or caught up in the Messiah complex. To be frank, there have been times when people earning $1 million a month, far more than us, question our sanity for choosing to try to elevate the entire industry instead of becoming gazillionaires by continuing to frontline recruit globally. Our response to them is simple. Read Living with Passion by Peter Hirsch. We found our passion. We are irrevocably convinced that network marketing is the very best high-integrity economic system for global solutions to some very pressing problems in such places as third-world countries. And lest you not understand what we mean by pressing problems, we'll give you just one example. It has now been estimated that by the year 2000, some 40 million people worldwide will have died of AIDS, leaving behind some 5 million orphans, 90% of whom live in Africa and other third world countries. As of this printing, not one agency has yet been created to deal with this problem. There are so many enormous global problems just waiting for us out there. Many network marketers earning millions each year have joined us in projects to make the world a better place. There are indeed things more pressing than becoming excessively wealthy, and we in MLM have the money and time freedom to make a difference. We aren't alone in being plagued with the Messiah complex. Joe Tonita is one idealistic network marketer who, like many, shares this phenomenon. The biggest challenge to me was figuring out who was really going to build a business once they showed an interest. To succeed, one must have belief before evidence. That is, they have to be able to picture themselves there and feel the emotions of it long before it actually happens. I didn't understand that initially, so I simply worked and managed others who were unable to see the end results, and then became quite frustrated when they quit. I wanted everyone to succeed, so I tended to spend too much energy and time helping in whatever manner I could. As a result, I found myself drained of energy and taking their failures personally. I overcame these challenges by learning how to facilitate visionary goal-setting, but I'm still very selective about those with whom I choose to work. I realize that my success will be directly related to what I think about the most and where I direct my energy. It's unnecessary to fall into a management mode when what we truly need to do as a leader is provide a duplicable strategy for our new associates, then allow them to create their own success. Joe and Rick Tonita are networkers who are among the top sales leaders in their company in Canada, having now been nearly 20 years with only one company. It is our hope that many more network marketers will be able to say that with pride over the next 20 years. When you find yourself frustrated because your associates are not successful, teach them how to visualize the end result and direct most of your energy toward those who do. Just recruit a few and drive their lines deep. One common misconception in the network marketing industry has led people down into the administration pit. Certain leaders contend that the key to success in our industry is finding four or five good people, then driving their groups by focusing exclusively on supporting them until they are wealthy, then finding five more and doing the same thing. That is the absolute antithesis of what is required to succeed in our profession. The three magic words are, go wide fast. 
Recruit as many frontline distributors each month as you can until you are earning at least $10,000 a month consistently. Then you can relax a bit until you feel refreshed, only to run right back out there into the frontline recruiting trenches. Unfortunately, some well-meaning authors and leaders have done a horrible disservice to our profession by misleading new distributors into believing that success in our industry requires less effort than it really does. People who teach this philosophy do so innocently, because that's what they've been taught through their upline leaders, who learn to do this through books and tapes. The first 90 days of warm market prospecting are much more personal and support-intensive, since new distributors are focused on their friends and families. We will discuss this more in later chapters. But the truth is that you cannot hope to achieve a tremendous income, like those huge figures the legends in our industry earn, unless you play it as a numbers game, especially once you enter the cold market. Ron Wiggins, who left the shoe business after 11 years to join network marketing at the age of 27, said one of the most important things he learned in his first year is that success defies all logic, so quit trying to figure it out. Just do the numbers, and when prospecting large numbers of people, don't try to tell them everything you know. It's a matter of raising their curiosity, not satisfying it. He goes on, I was doing so much of the wrong, eventually it just started to add up. From all the mistakes I made, I learned, and now teach from experience, to eliminate logic in your own mind and simply do what's been done by the experts and authorities of the industry, who have already made all the mistakes themselves. You've got to get rid of any personal perceptions you may have and try to accept from the beginning that it's going to be a lot of hard work on a very consistent basis. After a year of hard work, Ron had matched his previous income. Shortly thereafter, his wife, Chris, also left her job and together, working full-time, they have become one of the top network distributor teams in Dallas. It took Ron and Chris four and a half years to reach the very pinnacle of their company's compensation plan. Today, they earn a five-figure monthly income. They have utilized their experience to become experts at training and have learned to keep it simple so that their system can be easily duplicated. If network marketers were truly doing the numbers that it takes to succeed, no one would have time to fall into the entrapment of administration. Human nature looks for the line of least resistance, and, clearly, it is much easier to work with existing distributors than it is to face the daily rejection that occurs when recruiting new people. Because this is a business of duplication, your people will do what you do. If you manage your downline, so will they. If you spend most of your time prospecting and recruiting, so will they. The secret is not managing your organization. Rather, it's finding leaders who will, in turn, find other leaders. Generally, leaders must be found. They cannot be created. But many people have untapped leadership skills that do not manifest themselves until the timing is right. In order to find those leaders, you must keep prospecting and recruiting, realizing that new blood is the lifeblood of any network marketing organization. Recruiting is the only viable way to offset the inevitability of attrition. This is a numbers game that inevitably becomes a people business once distributors are sponsored into the business, often forging lifetime bonds. It would indeed be wonderful if we could all skip to the bank each month with checks for $10,000 after merely working with a handful of frontline leaders. It is human nature to want to believe that there is an easy way to achieve this goal. We warn you against leaders and authors who grossly and unfairly mislead people by projecting concepts that feel easy and effortless to everybody, yet don't work. Don't be taken in by those who teach management as a philosophy of success, because it is indeed the very cause of as much as 50% of the failures in our industry. Here's the scenario. A new associate is exposed unwittingly to this system spends a few weeks talking five friends into signing up. Then the rest of his or her short career consists of attempting to drag those five people over the finish line. Then, the next thing you know, our network marketer is having weekly babysitting sessions in the living room of someone's home. Fortunately for Amway, 
Two of their biggest leaders saw the folly of this philosophy early on. Because, as leaders, they command so much respect and loyalty from their downlines, they were able to immediately replace this concept with more realistic guidelines by replacing one best-selling book from their sales tool repertoire. We truly believe that one of the several reasons that Amway has continued to grow and become a multi-billion dollar empire, while none of their competitors have done half as well, is the absence of widespread dissemination of this management philosophy. Their distributors don't try to manage everyone. They continue to place their emphasis on showing the plan, thereby adding new frontline distributors. It is the same with our own downline. Over the years, we have promoted Power Multi-Level Marketing, our book, and All You Can Do by A.L. Williams. Consequently, our most successful leaders continue to recruit large numbers of frontline distributors and teach their people to do the same. Babysitting the Downline Before we met, one of Renee's most promising groups was in Rochester, New York. It was a dynamic growing leg of her organization led by a couple, Gary and Lori, who were self-sufficient with all of the vision, the integrity, and the enthusiasm to succeed at network marketing. They sponsored a friend named Mike, who was their strongest catalyst. For nearly two years, everything went well. Renee traveled there twice a year to work with them, and the rest of the time she supported them with teleconference and speakerphone meetings. There were generally two to three hundred people in attendance, and the number of emerging leaders was growing with each visit. It was the epitome of how a long-distance networking organization can succeed. Then, almost in a single week, it all changed. Mike, once the best recruiter in the whole group, had secretly slipped into a management mode. His group was sizable, and he felt it was time to devote his energy to overseeing their recruitment activities. Because of his strong personality, no one felt they could do anything as well as he did it. With Mike so readily available, his organization leaned on him for everything— presentations, hand-holding sessions, closings, sizzle sessions, product clinics, and pep talks on the phone. Depressed and discouraged, Mike phoned Gary, who suggested that he talk to Renee. The phone call went something like this. Mike, you sound down. What's the problem? Renee was concerned. I don't know. It just isn't working anymore. I'm absolutely fed up with babysitting my group. Isn't there anyone out there who can just do it on their own? Mike, you're the best recruiter in the business. How many people have you sponsored this month? There was a hesitation before he answered. I'm too busy babysitting, and no matter how hard I work, my group isn't growing anymore. I don't get it. You know the saying, new blood is the lifeblood of this business. Stop recruiting and your organization dies a slow death. You want it to come alive? Go back to what works and what you do best. Recruit. I just can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. It looks like I'll be babysitting the rest of my life. Ask my wife. I'm not even good at babysitting my own kids. If I could just find a way to do this without babysitting. One month later, Mike found a new company, a wholesale buyer's club. It was exactly what Mike was looking for. A deal with no inventory, no product information to learn, no training required, and no babysitting a downline. Just sponsor people, and when they order anything, the upline gets a cut. Or so he thought. He told everyone in Rochester about this great new company. Gary and Lori were horrified, but fearing that they would lose out, they also signed up in the new company, just in case. Nearly all the leaders followed Mike into this new deal but only as a backup to our company, of course. Yet because of this distraction, many of Gary and Lori's downline lost focus. The last time Renee went to Rochester, Gary and Lori were out of the business, and the number of serious players had dwindled from a few hundred down to about twenty-five. Six months later, the Wholesale Buyers Club was out of business. When we stopped to analyze what happened, we realized it all started when Mike stopped recruiting and became discouraged with babysitting his group. This was the time to give extensive support to the Rochester group, a time for new leaders to emerge. 
Had Gary and Lori been able to stay focused themselves and not let Mike divert them and their entire organization, this group could have become one of our largest legs. If the clock of time could be rewound, Renee would love to have them all back. I had built a close relationship, both upline and downline, to Gary and Lori, and I miss these friendships that were once a regular part of my life. But once an organization has fallen apart, it is far easier to give birth to new people than it is to try to revive the dead. Experience Abroad One of our most graphic examples of the management trap occurred when we opened a foreign market. We sponsored one couple, taught them everything we knew, and worked through them to build a dynasty in the new country. We developed a friendship and found that we shared many things in common, including similar life values. Prior to the official launch, we did weekly teleconference calls, which is both a legitimate and efficient way to build a new market prior to a company's opening. Through our mutual effort and to our delight and surprise, we had more than 1,500 serious prospects attend our opening day celebration at a private location hosted by us. For us personally, it was the single largest launch of a foreign market in which we had ever participated. And yet, a year and a half later, our frontline couple's income continued to drop below their first executive check. How was this possible after such an awesome beginning? Prior to the official launch, everything was kept to a simple system. No hotel meetings, just friends telling friends. No literature. Not even products, because they weren't allowed to be sold yet. But almost immediately after the opening, the couple we sponsored stopped building their front line and started managing their group. In fact, they spent the next 18 months creating sales tools and coaching those struggling on their front line to buy as much product as they needed in order to meet monthly requirements for advancement. Although we translated our own materials for their use, they were convinced that their culture required something different, so they developed a new manual to replace ours. They developed slides for hotel meetings because they believed their compatriots would respond especially well to that kind of presentation. They worked with flip chart presenters and overhead projectors, and then, of course, wound up continually updating all those materials because their downline leaders were never quite satisfied. They traveled all over the country spending money they didn't have to speak at hotel meetings being held by their downline. While serving as administrators to their organization, they had no time left for such mundane activities as frontline recruiting. This couple sponsored 31 people their first month. They sponsored an additional 19 people over the next four months. But both of them working full-time sponsored only six new distributors over the next 15 months. In other words, they sponsored 50 people the first five months, and then, with so much time invested in managing their organization, averaged only one new associate every two and a half months thereafter. This couple was far more achievement-oriented than materialistic, and therefore they were more interested in setting records and receiving recognition than in making money. Their goal was to be the first in their country to reach the maximum recognition level in our company. They achieved their goal, only temporarily, but their entrance into the management trap ruined what should have been our greatest income-producing leg. The couple quit in frustration. To this day, they blame it all on the compensation plan, the product pricing, and the failure of the industry in that country. They worked as hard as any two people have ever worked in network marketing. But it wasn't the cost of merchandise that led to their failure, nor was it the company's remuneration method or the inadequacy of network marketing in that part of the world. It was caretaking their organization, combined with their futile need to be first, that brought them down. Their downfall began their fifth month in the business when they stopped recruiting Frontline. The good news is that this is not the end of the story. Two other top leaders followed them out of the business, but at the request of some of the emerging leaders in this group, we are continuing to work with them. They have learned the hard way this lesson of trying to watchdog their groups and have gone back to basics, building a small customer base, prospecting, going wide on their front lines, working a simple, easily duplicated system out of their homes.
We believe in this group and in its leadership, and are convinced that this time they are on track to set both economic and industry records in their country. It's crucial to learn from other people's mistakes, so pay close attention to this story. If you stop building your front line before you have a solid income, you will fail in this business. No one can succeed by sponsoring only one new distributor every two and a half months. And even worse, by your example, you will teach your people to do the same. Full-time network marketers recruit for a minimum of two to three years before they can slow down. For part-timers, it takes longer than that. Set your sights on the goal. Strive consistently to meet the steps outlined in your business plan, and don't look for excuses. Whatever it takes, just do it. The piano story. We have a story we like to share with people early in their careers. It's a great illustration that may help you in training and supporting your own organization. Imagine an audience of five hundred people seated before a stage with a grand piano. Suddenly, out walks a person who has never had even one lesson and knows nothing about music. After the applause dissipates, he very aggressively begins to bang out horrible combinations of sounds that literally hurt one's ears. At first, the audience glances around the room in utter shock and disbelief. Following a full ten minutes of pathetic piano beating, the audience begins to boo and hiss. Within a couple of minutes, their boos drown out the performer, who calmly stands, bows, and walks off. As the hacker exits, a pianist with thirty years' experience enters from the other side of the stage. He methodically and flawlessly plays a beautiful Mozart concerto. When he's finished, the crowd leaps to its feet and gives him a thunderous ovation as he bows two or three times, then exits the stage. In the dressing room, the expert pianist notices that the first performer is gently humming to himself and adjusting his tie before leaving. Although the expert pianist is somewhat embarrassed to bring up the subject, his curiosity finally gets the best of him. He smiles in the mirror at the first performer and asks a question. Forgive me for intruding, but I notice you aren't particularly offended by what just happened out there. I have to ask you, what's it like to be booed off a stage? I mean, isn't it horribly degrading? The gentleman turns around so that he is facing the pianist, and with all seriousness responds, Oh no, I didn't take it personally. It was the piano. Perhaps one of the most interesting elements of human nature is our tendency, and to a greater or lesser degree we all possess it, to place blame elsewhere. The truth is, while many people criticize our industry after they fail, it's not the fault of the industry. As in the preceding story, a poor musician can't legitimately blame the piano for his lack of talent. You may want to remember this story and share it with new distributors. The Buy-In Of all the possible fiascos stemming from the management trap, buying in for your downline or teaching them to do this for their distributors is the worst. Marketers who get caught spending more time managing than recruiting often get snared into this trap, which has serious legal consequences. And when law enforcement goes after a buy-in pyramid deal, we all look bad by association. Success in network marketing results from the creation of real volume as opposed to promotional volume. Real volume is produced from orders of satisfied customers and distributors who use and love the products or services, ordering them month after month, thus creating long-term stable sales volume in that organization. It is the most important type of volume because it represents money spent by bona fide customers for items that their families consume and then reorder. Promotional volume results from multiple product packages that are ordered by distributors who may be attempting to buy their way to the next level or intend to use these packages to get their new distributors started in the business. Buying in will always backfire with distributors who simply cannot afford it and have no legitimate outlet for moving the products. When new associates join your organization and have definite prospects to whom they know they can sell their starter packages, 
Promotional volume can be a valuable tool for creating the often needed initial volume swell to get distributors through qualification requirements. But first-year networkers often get confused by this sudden spurt of success and start thinking that they have created a solid flow of volume throughout their organization. Promotional volume does not result in a stable organization. Both types of volume serve their purpose in network marketing, but the majority of new distributors will benefit from being introduced to a low-cost product starter package consisting of products, training, or services they will personally use, which is the essence of starting people in our business. Some people caught up in supervising their groups who are simultaneously working toward promotions and higher rankings within their companies will often purchase unneeded products and then teach their personally sponsored frontline distributors to do the same thing in order to meet requirements for advancement. However, if distributors are doing this business right, they will be recruiting enough new people each month in order to advance through the ranks properly. But if they start attempting to manage a small group of marketers, they may find at the end of the month that their sales volume requirements are not adequate. So they simply call in an order for products they don't really need or intend to sell in order to meet promotion requirements, hence the name promotional volume. Front-end loading is forbidden by state and federal regulators who believe that such activities are pyramid-like in nature. We agree. In fact, we have a term for this kind of activity, garage qualifying. We sometimes wonder how many American garages are crammed to overflowing with non-run pantyhose, 3D cameras, home insulation, videos, and other non-consumable products. If all of America's garage products were put together for one big flea market, we're sure it would stretch from Missouri to Maine. Don't ever allow yourself to be duped into believing that you can buy your way to the top of a company. You can't. And if for any reason your company's compensation plan is set up to reward those who buy in, it's just a matter of time before some attorney general or federal trade commission representative slams the regulatory cease and desist order on the company. The process of buying in never leads to long-term success. It only serves to bridge the gap between levels in a compensation plan. We do not know any distributors earning big money who bought their way to the top. But we know many who have garages full of products. Of course, if the leader is seen buying in, the troops will all do the same. In a short time, you've got a bunch of people with garages full of dust-gathering products, and then it's just a matter of time until they become disgusted and quit. And when they do... Rest assured, they'll tell everyone who will listen what a horrible scam this industry is. Many of the better companies have implemented product return policies of up to 90%, which precludes people from being burdened with so many products. It can be a rude awakening for a buy-in leader when his check arrives and it's minimal because his company has charged back all returns from the very angry distributors whom he front-end loaded. Some network marketers, in their eagerness to get off to a fast start, simply don't understand this philosophy and will make the mistake of skipping over the critical step of creating real volume in their organizations. It is vital that all new distributors begin with a solid commitment to use as much product as possible, share the product personally, especially among close family and friends, and teach everyone in their organization to do the same. As simplistic as this may seem, it must be done before beginning the more dramatic and gratifying process of creating large recruiting volume through your power players and teaching them to duplicate the process. It is the balance of both types of volume, promotional, to propel you into success in the early days, and real, to stabilize your volume and provide ongoing residual income that results in the long-term success we all desire. Promotional volume is extremely valuable, but your business can survive without it. However, failure to create real volume can lead to the eventual stagnation and collapse of your organization. Just give me your list and I'll do all the work. In early 1990, Mark recruited a man whose father-in-law owned the largest citrus company in the South and had access to the most prestigious office address in Florida. Their boardroom on the 55th floor 
overlooked the ocean and had seating for three hundred. We'll call these distributors by the names of Jeff and Mary. Jeff and Mary had a Rolodex of over five thousand people, many of whom were small business owners and most of whom were entrepreneurs. Although Jeff and Mary had thousands of people to prospect, they fell victim to running an adult daycare center to which anyone in their organization could send prospects. Mark didn't fully understand the whole problem until it was too late. All he saw were the numbers, and their volumes looked great. Unfortunately, Jeff and Mary began managing their organization prematurely, and the group decreased in size from three thousand to five hundred people. Here's what went wrong: Never tell people that all they've got to do is sign up, give you a list of potential distributors, and then you'll do the rest. It doesn't work. Jeff signed up ten people on his front line, then immediately told these men and women, some of Miami's real movers and shakers, to start sending prospects to his weekly meetings conducted exclusively on the top floor of their corporate building. He explained that he and Mary had the time to do the meetings and train the distributors, and that his people would merely need a wheelbarrow to take to their mailbox each day in order to carry all the money. For two months, everything went fine. Every one of the noon meetings on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays were filled with curious prospects sent by bosses or close, wealthy friends to investigate this business opportunity. By the middle of the second month, Mary also had to launch Monday and Thursday meetings, and by the end of the next month, those too were filled. Many prospects were signing up, and their weekly volumes in starter kits alone were going through the ceiling. But everything changed the Monday that they announced that people were going to have to start doing their own presentations at their own homes in order to take care of the spillover. Just imagine the chaos! To begin with, Jeff had trained no one to do anything except send him leads, and none of the frontline people who had signed up under his ten personally sponsored folks had been trained to do anything but send in their prospects. Simply put, in month three. Jeff and Mary were so caught up in the muck and mire of the management trap that they couldn't move in any direction. Some new distributors were saying they'd been misled and demanded their money back. Some were angry that they hadn't yet met qualification requirements. After all, they'd been sending Jeff and Mary leads for eighty days. Where was this fifteen thousand dollars a month they'd heard about? One small group revolted and went to another office complex to begin their own meetings, but no one wanted to go there or send their people because the leader wasn't as good a speaker as Jeff, and they complained that the office wasn't as attractive. Two couples got together and hired an attorney on a contingency basis and filed a misrepresentation slash fraud case against Jeff, who then had to spend countless hours preparing for depositions. Mary and Jeff, without Mark's presence in Florida to supervise what they were doing wrong, purposefully hid from him the system they were using. They knew he deplored big recruiting meetings, that he spoke against offices, that he taught everyone to avoid babysitting distributors at all costs. They fully understood his "go wide fast" advice, putting as many people on one's front line as possible until wealth had been achieved. Yet they fell victim to the management trap. Had Mark been in Florida instead of Austin, Texas, he might have been able to steer them right. Or had they been honest about their methods, he could have salvaged the situation. All he heard about were the many great people they were recruiting and all the great volumes being achieved. By the time he discovered the truth, it was too late, for they had both mentally and emotionally burned out. Within five months of the day that Mark sponsored Jeff and Mary, they were selling everything but their clothes and leaving town humiliated. Mary's father had virtually disowned the two of them for embarrassing an old money family in the Deep South, where image is everything. And we can tell you unequivocally that with their talent and with all the names in their rolodex of reputable entrepreneurs whom they knew on a first name basis. All they had to do to succeed was teach the big hitters to begin with their twenty-five prime contacts, do in homes, and go wide fast. Those three magic words are synonymous with building your front line, not your depth, as quickly as you can. The depth takes care of itself with sufficient numbers and width. 
Jeff and Mary needed to do only two simple things in order to avoid their problems and ultimately become successful. First, look for close friends who were entrepreneurial types, ready for change and fed up with stress, and then show them by example the wonderful simplicity of in-home recruiting meetings. Second, do the first couple of meetings for each new distributor, then cut the cord thus enabling their distributors to become leaders themselves. Ours is a business of leaders building their front lines and teaching their people to do the same. Those with leadership ability will seek out other top leaders to mentor them and give them help in closing serious prospects. It is in this way that genuine support is given. Rather than working your new associates list, teach your distributors how to work their own. They can come to you for support, that is assistance in closing, after their prospects have been shown the presentation. How do you support a large group, you may ask? By teaching them three words. You call me. And when those calls come, be there for them. Be there to render moral support, coaching assistance, help in closing prospects. But don't do for them what they must do for themselves. They must prospect, recruit, and train their own frontline associates. Quit or take it to the moon. The truth is that success in our industry does not result from extensive management. Success comes from a person with leadership skills having the vision, enthusiasm, and willingness to recruit other frontline leaders who, in turn, use and share the products or services. Then simply teach them to duplicate the process. Larry Pepe was a new networker who experienced a series of nightmares starting up his business. His sponsor quit almost immediately. His upline executive tried to talk him out of going forward on the accelerated program. Of his first 23 distributors, 22 quit, and of his first three in qualification, all failed. One of his gold stars was arrested one month before becoming his first executive. Another turned out to be a con man who was being sued for fraud, and a heavy hitter from Australia was diagnosed with terminal cancer. All of this in the first three months of Larry's new network marketing business. Then came the crowning blow. The upline leader who had supported him called to say she would not be available for a while because of personal problems that she needed to resolve. Larry remembered sitting on the edge of his bed after hanging up the phone, staring blankly into space, thinking, God is testing me. This is it. I either quit or become a leader right now and take this thing to the moon. A few minutes later, his mother called and said, for the life of her, she couldn't understand why a talented young attorney with a master's degree in clinical psychology, who owned a successful business, would give all of that up to be a vitamin salesman. Larry is convinced that all of those experiences, especially being left on his own, which forced him to become a leader to his organization, were the best things that ever happened to him in business. He went to work frontline recruiting and refused to slow down until he achieved his first goal. Today, he and his upline leader work closely together, and she fondly refers to him as Hercules. And the best part, says Larry, is, My mom doesn't think of me as a vitamin salesman anymore. Thank God for small miracles. This story teaches us that we need not be managers and demonstrates that people who have the will to succeed will succeed, regardless of the circumstances. Summary Managing an organization is a time-wasting practice that does for others what they should be doing for themselves, thereby creating codependency. Supporting the members of your group means being there for them when they call to ask for guidance, moral support, or request that you talk to one of their serious prospects. Managing organizations for our families and friends often causes the very people we love most to fail. Practicing a management mode is counterproductive for both those being managed and those doing the managing. We are empowered far less by heredity, luck, and circumstances than by our vision of what we believe is truly possible for ourselves. Don't be offended. Be joyous when new recruits finish their training and go to work without calling you every day and asking you to do everything for them. 
In this business, everyone has the ability to do great things, but those who lean on their uplines for every single thing are usually the ones who fail. What makes our industry so much grander than traditional employment opportunities is the fact that we are compensated ethically and generously for our productivity. If new associates want to earn more than the leader above them, they just need to be more productive, i.e., recruit more active frontline distributors and customers than do their uplines. If you become frustrated because your associates are not successful, teach them to visualize the end result and direct most of your energy toward those who do. Because this is a business of duplication, your people will do what you do. If you manage your downline, so will they. If you spend most of your time prospecting and recruiting, so will they. Babysitting a downline is not an effective way to build a business. The key to successfully building a large, dynamic organization is to steadily continue to prospect and recruit, creating a wide front line. Don't make the mistake that results in nearly 50% of the failures in our industry, building your front line for the first few months, then stopping to manage your people. Merely overseeing the activities of your organization is not leading them, but rather misleading them into rearranging their deck chairs on the Titanic. Set your sights on the goal, consistently meet the steps outlined in your business plan, and don't make excuses. Whatever it takes, just do it. Of all the possible fiascos stemming from the administration of your organization, buying in for your downline or teaching them to do this for their distributors is the worst. Promotional volume, that is, money spent on products, samples, and multiple kits, is initially a means of helping distributors meet volume requirements for qualification. Real volume, that is, products or services ordered for regular monthly usage by satisfied customers and distributors, is what ultimately creates passive residual income and is the essence of what makes network marketing a viable, ongoing business. Your business can survive without promotional volume, but failure to create real volume by not acquiring legitimate customers or not using all your own products can lead to the collapse of your entire organization. Network marketing is a business of distributors building their own front lines and teaching their people to duplicate that process. If each network marketer builds his own front line, following the advice, go wide fast, the depth will take care of itself and the cream will always rise to the top. Support a large organization by teaching them three words, you call me. Be there for your downline to render moral support, coaching, and assistance in closing their prospects, but don't try to do for them what they must do for themselves. Success comes to people with leadership skills, a sound vision, enthusiasm, and the willingness to put forth the effort to build an organization and find others who will do the same.